Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to week seven of our Archives in Crisis series. Um, I want to make note first before we really begin that May 1st, um, the Society of American Archivists, the Smithsonian, and the American Institute uh, for Conservation all celebrate uh, a version of May Day that looks at disaster response um, and archives, which is fitting that we would be in this week and having this series uh, at this particular moment in time. They provide a bunch of trainings online um, that you can access if you go to our department Facebook page, Twitter page, uh, and even on Instagram. Uh, we've had some tweets and social media posts about it with links to their trainings, uh, and you can check those out at a different time. Um, the Archives in Crisis series, as you know, is an in-depth course on how to respond to rapid onset and slow occurring crises. Uh, it's funded by a grant from the Louisiana Board of Regents Support Fund, the Gilbo Center for Public History, the Gilbo Charitable Trust, and the Department of History at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. We'd like to give thanks today to the Light Center uh, for hosting us here, for AOC Media, who's filming in the back uh, and allows those that are not able to be with us to catch up online um, or to view the sessions that they were unable to attend, uh, and to our graduate assistants who have organized this series from start to finish. Uh, so that includes Summer Abukamra, who's in the back, and Julia Fontenot, uh, who down here. I'd also like to thank the co-directors, besides myself, at the Gilbo Center for Public History, uh, which includes Ian Beamish uh, and Marissa Petru. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things, uh, things that you're familiar with by week seven, but I just want to mention um, the Wi-Fi for the Light Center uh, is Light Public Wireless, uh, and the password is lights at light, uh, and you should be able to log on. So if you need to look up anything during Dr. Cohen's talk, um, you can go ahead and log on to the wireless. Um, we have one final week left in our series uh, next Friday. Uh, week eight will feature a talk by Stephen Sloan, uh, who is the director of the Baylor Institute for Oral History, uh, and will be discussing uh, oral history after crisis and the collection of memories of those who have experienced them, as well as the digital preservation of oral histories and other audio and video recording um, equipment uh, and storage. So we're really excited excited to welcome him. Before I let Julia take over to do our introduction of our speaker today, Aaron Cowan, I'm going to introduce Marissa Petru, who's going to talk about the land acknowledgement initiative happening here at the uh, Gilbo Center for Public History and UL Lafayette. Thank you all for joining us for week seven. So. Um. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for coming today. As many of you know, um, one of the aims of the center is to develop land acknowledgement guidelines for the university and for other cultural and educational institutions um, in the region. And uh, every week, I've, presenting, I've been presenting a slightly different version of a land acknowledgement based on my conversations that I've been having with um, the different Native American tribes in the region, as well as more broadly. Um, so today, um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the 24 tribal nations of the Louisiana region and the history of settler colonialism that has taken place in this country. And I would like to express my gratitude and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future for stewarding this land so that we can carry out our work today. Now I turn it over to our grad assistant, Julia Fontenot. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, our speaker for today is Aaron Cowan. Aaron Cowan is an associate professor of history at Slippery Rock University and director of the university's Stonehouse Center for Public Humanities, which works to build community partnerships with that expand public engagement with the humanities. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, hello everyone. I'd like to, uh, uh, first of all, say, uh, you know, as we're continuing the thanking, uh, um, thanking the History Department and the Gilbo Center uh, for inviting me to, uh, to come talk to you today. Um, and uh, so we're gonna um, spend some time here. Uh, today I wanna you know, do a couple of different things. I wanna uh, introduce myself, of course, a bit, tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from and kind of the context. 
and um, uh, tell you something of what uh, my experiences have been regarding grant writing, fundraising, um, in a, uh, you know, in, in some ways we can think about this as a time of crisis uh, in thinking about funding for um, cultural institutions, for museums, uh, for the humanities in general. Um, you know, that these are times in which funding is scarce. Uh, it's often, uh, you know, highly competitive. Um, and so we want to think about how to operate in that environment and how to thrive. Because um, I think there is a way for um, institutions to thrive in this environment. But, um, so we're going to talk about that and then ho hopefully we will get into um, dialogue, into some discussion. I'll also say at any point, um, this isn't a canned talk where if you, uh, if you suddenly interrupt me, I won't remember where I really need to reset. So feel free to raise your hand uh, if you want to ask questions in the middle. Um, that's great. So please, uh, please do that. So um, uh, just a bit of, a bit of background uh, on me. Um, I, uh, I teach, uh, as, as Julia said, at Slippery Rock University, which uh, some of you may or may not know where that is. Uh, it's in western Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Pittsburgh. It's a uh, small state university, about eight or 9,000 students. <clears throat> and I teach um, urban history, environmental history, and public history. Um, and uh, when I uh, came to the university, I was given as part of my job um, the management of a uh, small museum um, called the Old Stone House. Um, and through a period of a number of different years uh, of working with this, uh, it's essentially a 19th century restored stagecoach uh, tavern. Um, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, working with students at the site uh, and working with the community, um, there was a sense that uh, um, there was limited uh, potential for us to do things there uh, in terms of the way it had traditionally been framed as a, a sort of history museum. You come and see the spinning wheel, you come and see the butter churn, right? Uh, um, and what else are we doing here, right? Everybody takes a tour. Many people say, I went there you know, a dozen times when I was a kid. I don't know why I ever need to go there again. Right, uh, um, and a lot of the students felt frustrated by uh, limitations on interpretation that were there that had traditionally been there at the site. Um, so that led to a process of reevaluating <clears throat> the house and what uh, um, what it, it might serve as for the community, and led eventually uh, to the development of <clears throat> what's now the uh, Stone House Center for Public Humanities. Um, the uh, idea. The goal, the vision was to expand uh, not only what goes on at the site, but to use the house as a jumping off point for various kinds of community engagement broadly, not just in history, but in the humanities broadly. So in you know, working with the philosophy department, working with the English department, working with uh, anthropologists uh, to engage people um, outside of the uh, um, college campus. Because we had this divide that's very classic in, in college towns, right? That uh, you had the campus, which often lived in its own bubble, right? Uh, and then you had the community. Um, so, you know, hey, there's gonna be a lecture on campus on Thursday night. Uh, okay, well, I don't know, I'm interested in history. I'd like to hear that. Um, well, I didn't go to college, so I don't know. Are you supposed to dress up, right? Uh, you know, where is Spots World Cultures Building 112? Where do I park, right? Um, what are going to be the expectations? There's a limitation there, and you, you, so you had these two worlds operating separately. And we thought that the, the Stone House was a good model for a place, a site of community engagement. It was owned by the university, but most of the town didn't know that. <laughs> um, uh, it was a place they felt very comfortable going to. Again, they had been there many times, probably. It was a landmark that people kind of knew. Um, uh, and so it could be this great uh, sort of meeting point, right? This bridge between um, the community and, uh, and the campus. <clears throat> and so that has led to, um, I can show you uh, our website here. Um, <clears throat> that has led to <clears throat> the development of this Center for Public Humanities, which does a number of um, different uh, types of things. Again, both on site at the house, but also um, uh, in other areas of the community as well. Um, so uh, you've got our, our sort of mission statement there, right? Uh, to provide opportunities uh, to celebrate cultural heritage, foster innovative educational experiences, and highlight the humanities relevance to contemporary life, right? Um, 
And so what does that mean exactly? Well, you know, actually this little photo slideshow that's going here um, shows you a few of the things. Um, so uh, we reworked some of our programming uh, to focus on historic foodways. Um, we, uh, you know, we hosted the summer reading program for the public library. Um, we had an archaeology day where people could bring things they found in their field or in their backyard. Hey, is this an arrowhead? Hey, is this a piece of pottery? Can you tell me something about it? And we had, you know, real live archaeologists there um, who could tell them something. We had a uh, homebrewed history in uh, which we picked a historical uh, period, uh, researched what kinds of beer people made during that historical period, and one of the art professors was a home brewer, so he said, okay, I'll, I'll research, I'll find the recipe, I'll find the ingredients, so we make the beers, we have a lecture. People are way more interested in a history lecture when they're drinking beer, right? It's really uh, uh, remarkable how that works. But the, one of the great things about that event, I remember, is um, a guy in a NASCAR hat, right? Uh, who was talking with my colleague's husband, who is a retired art professor uh, from Great Britain, right? And here's, you know, the guy in the NASCAR hat and the art professor having a conversation, right? And so that was kind of uh, really the model. Um, some of these are uh, advocacy days on campus. Um, they, we sponsor a little free library. You've probably seen these before in the town. Um, and so a number of different ways that we <laughs> are trying to provide opportunities for the community to engage with the university. And um, <clears throat> the, yeah, sorry, I'm still figuring out the details of how this part works. The most successful program uh, that I think that we've, uh, um, yeah, sorry, just a second. Let me find my mouse. There it is. Right. Yeah, we're not doing that one yet. The most successful program and sort of our flagship program um, has been uh, an initiative called the Humanities Ladder. Um, and this was a, an idea that came out of uh, a desire to connect um, with low-income public schools in the area um, <laughs> and schools that had a high percentage of what's called low SES, uh, um, so, uh, you know, uh, low-income families underrepresented minority populations, uh, um, they're heavily segregated schools. And so we started a program um, in which we recruited humanities faculty to go into the schools, into a classroom, um, and to uh, teach their subject to 10th graders, to 11th graders, to 12th graders, um, to teach some art history, right? To teach some philosophy, to teach metal smithing, which was my favorite one. We, we got an art guy in there, and uh, uh, the same guy who's the home brewer, actually. Um, uh, and by doing so, yes, it's about the some of it's about the subject, but a lot of it's about helping break down many of the barriers for students who are very capable of college-level work. Um, but a lot of the research on why many of those students don't either enroll in college or matriculate and graduate from college has to do with um, obstacles that aren't necessarily financial and they're not necessarily academic ability. Um, much of it has to do with these kind of soft, intangible obstacles, feeling like you don't fit in. You've never talked to a college professor before, uh, so you're intimidated, right? I felt this way and my parents had gone to college, right? Um, I used to like try to think of smart things to say if I was going to go talk to the professor, right? Because I was afraid of looking dumb when I really should have just gone in and said, I don't understand what the hell is going on, right? Um, but so that, you know, ideally if the, um, uh, if the student has, uh, you know, has gone through the humanities ladder program, um, they've been, uh, you know, they've worked alongside a number of college professors um, and they've uh, gotten a chance to <clears throat> see what different disciplines uh, um, and uh, you know, different kinds of cultural experiences uh, that are embedded into this. Uh, and so it's helping to, uh, you know, at least we, we hope, uh, it's helping to bridge uh, some of those obstacles that, uh, um, you know, that prevent many of these students from going on to college and from, uh, um, you know, achieving their kind of educational goals, right? Um, so that program uh, was, a, uh, was again a pretty successful one in terms of grant funding and that's probably where I've gotten the most experience in writing grants. Um, one that, uh, 
And so it's been supported by several different uh, um, significant grants. <laughs> we get, we uh, were successful in securing a humanities access grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities in 2017 uh, for $100,000. Um, that was both exhilarating and really frightening because the other requirement was you have to find another $100,000, right? <laughs> um, which uh, is you know, not the easiest thing to do. Um, so that put us on a, a trajectory um, uh, scrambling uh, with, uh, you know, to uh, you know, seek other places where we can get this funding, right? And we had some of this in mind already. We had been talking to several foundations um, and uh, were able to secure about $90,000 from private uh, foundations um, and then an additional $10,000 from private donors to, um, to match that funding and be able to actually uh, get the funding to support the humanities ladder. So um, that, uh, you know, that gives you a bit of sense of, of some of my you know, exposure and work and experience with grant writing. I've also been, uh, um, you know, once if you're successful in getting an NEH grant, then they always are keep roping you in to evaluate other people's grants. So I've served on a few of those review committees um, as well as some, some uh, state uh, grant review committees as well. So, uh, I'm not a, you know, professional grant writer. I'm not a, you know, I'm not an expert in this. Um, and, you know, really, uh, I can give you some sense of what I've, what I've learned in the process. Uh, you know, so um, that's just kind of a bit of background about me. And um, now we get on to the really important stuff, which is how do we get money, right? Um, so uh, any questions about any of that or any of the stuff I talked about? Again, feel free to interrupt uh, at any point. Uh, that's not a problem. All right, so um, again, we're gonna talk about, uh, um, talk about a few different things here. We're gonna talk about uh, um, uh, identifying funding sources, some of the things to keep in mind, some keys uh, to writing grant proposals, um, and some general principles that I would encourage you to think about in terms of fundraising and sustainability. All right. Um, so, first of all, who has the money? <laughs> um, so where is the money? Uh, how do we get it, okay? Um, so there are a number of different types, when you're talking about grants, there are a number of different types of grant-making organizations, right? There are, um, uh, certainly there are federal uh, um, uh, grants uh, that are available. The most uh, obvious one in terms of uh, history uh, organizations is the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and one of the misconceptions that I think a lot of people have about NEH is that it's the $100,000 grants. It's these major grants. There are NEH grants for $2,500, for $5,000, for much smaller. Not all of them require matching either, right? Um, so many times if you're thinking, well, we, we just really need a little grant, right? You know, that doesn't necessarily preclude something like the NEH. And I will say that the NEH has in recent years really shifted their philosophy, um, they still d very much support academic research um, uh, and those kind of endeavors, but there's a much greater emphasis on community engagement, on public history, on public uh, institutions that they want to support, right? So they like to see that, uh, and that, that's, there are a number of grants there for that now. There are state organizations, state uh, government funded organizations, the, again, the most uh, prominent and obvious one um, would be the state councils for the humanities. Uh, um, <coughs> so in, in Louisiana, it's the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Okay, in Pennsylvania, it's the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. But each one of these is uh, basically a sub-organization of the NEH, and they often have a number of different grants available. And then sometimes local governments uh, as well. So those are your kind of public uh, uh, monies that are uh, out there, right? Um, and then there are private foundations. So these are <laughs> organizations that are set up by, um, sometimes by charitable trusts of uh, um, you know, philanthropists, uh, people interested in using their money uh, towards some particular cause that they believe in um, or causes, uh, organizations that have been around for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> so there are a number of those uh, out there, right? And I'm gonna tell you how you figure out where these are and what these are. In just a second. Actually, I've got a, a handout I'll go ahead and give you. Um, and then there are, uh, you know, there's corporate uh, money. So, you know, <laughs> I, I 
chuckled every time I said it or wrote anything for it, but you know, like we applied for the humanities ladder to the Taco Bell Foundation, right? Because <laughs> um, uh, Taco Bell has a charitable foundation, who knew, right? Uh, but turns out they do. Um, so many companies uh, um, do have, uh, you know, money that they give away towards very often, uh, you know, uh, youth programs, educational programs, those kinds of things. And very often, uh, history museums, historic sites uh, can really fit nicely into a lot of those initiatives. I'm going to give you a handout, um, and I will, is there a way that we can, um, you know, share this electronically at some point uh, with people, um, just because it has some links and trying to, you know, type in some of these things uh, might be a, a bit uh, cumbersome for people, but oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Sorry, it's like I'm walled off here. Thank you, you can pass those out. So that's just a resource for later. Uh, it gives you a few, um, uh, and I think there's probably enough for everyone, but it gives you a few different uh, places where you can go. The Foundation Center, which um, is a, has a directory of private foundations um, everywhere in the, the country um, uh, that are available um, for, uh, you know, that have grants, uh, as well as, um, uh, there's uh, grants.gov, which uh, all federal uh, grants of any type, uh, that's sort of a main hub for, um, for those, uh, those grants. So you can go there, you can search, you can find them by category. Um, there's also a couple of resources there on uh, um, just general grant writing tips and advice. Um, there's one that I think is really nice done by uh, a woman named Sonia Levine. Um, uh, I think it was her MA thesis project uh, that's a grant writing guide specifically for public historians. So it's geared toward public history institutions. Um, it, uh, um, it lays out very clearly exactly what, uh, you know, the steps involved. It gives advice on grant writing, um, those kinds of things. So there are um, a number of different <coughs> uh, resources there uh, that I'll give you. I also really highly recommend uh, the American Association of State and Local History, um, which has uh, um, a, a number of resources, not just about fundraising, um, but uh, about you know, general management principles, all these sorts of things for historic sites and for museums. So um, that's, a, you know, that, that's a very quick uh, overview of um, you know, so the basic categories when we're talking about uh, grant writing. Um, so then, Let's say that you go through these databases, you do your searches, um, you begin to see some grants that, uh, um, that might look interesting to you. Um, what, uh, what's next? Well, um, how do I get the money? <laughs> we know who has the money, how do I get it? Um, very often, so there, there's, um, not always, um, most, you know, there's, there's variation in almost all these organizations, but especially when you're talking about private foundations now, um, they have what's called an LOI, a letter of inquiry, right? Um, and so you see one that says, oh, okay, we want to do uh, um, after school program for elementary age kids. Okay, uh, this place funds um, education initiatives for kids, grades kindergarten through, you know, six. Okay, great. Let's, uh, this seems like a good match, okay? So very often what they want you to do, rather than putting together, say, a 20-page, 50-page, whatever, grant proposal, is to uh, submit a, a, an LOI that can summarize in one or two pages the basic information, right? Hey, we are interested in X grant. We, uh, um, you know, we think that this would be the perfect uh, collaborative effort to expand our education program at this museum. Um, you know, here's uh, what we already do, here's what we could do uh, um, with more money, right? And then from there, um, you, uh, you may receive a call uh, from someone, very often so they'll have a, a designated contact person who will reach out, who will ask questions, right? Um, and they may want to know some pretty specific things. Okay, well, how long have you been doing this, right? How many kids go through here? Um, are you, uh, how are you measuring this, right? How are you evaluating whether it works or not, right? Um, uh, they may want to know some things, but that's actually uh, fantastic if someone calls you from the organization. And I would also recommend that if you send in an LOI or even before you send in one, that you make contact with the organization as well, right? Um, in a, you know, sort of, hey, uh, you know, just kind of establishing a relationship 
Like a lot of the grant uh, process, as much as we like to uh, believe that it's completely based on the merit of the program or the, uh, or the application, a lot of it's about relationships because then that helps you understand the goals of the organization. It helps you understand what they are trying to do, right? And then how you and uh, that organization might collaborate, right? So a lot of it's just about building that relationship. So if they call and they ask questions, you know, you shouldn't be uh, annoyed or you should be, yeah, this is exciting, right? Then you might be asked to um, submit a full application. Now, <clears throat> every organization, every, uh, um, whether it's a governmental agency or it's a, a private uh, foundation, have their own specifications. And I'm gonna talk about this on the next slide a bit more. But generally, these are the four pieces that you um, are asked to submit for almost any grant, right? What's the problem, right? And problem can be defined broadly to just say, well, what's this opportunity that we have? It doesn't have to be some uh, crisis in that particular, but you know, what's, what's the thing that you need money to fix, right? Um, a narrative that explains what you're going to do with the money, how it's going to fix the problem, right? How it's going to improve whatever the situation is. A budget, right? Um, and one of the things you wanna make sure of, by the way, is that what you say in here is also reflected in here. Right? <laughs> um, so you want to make sure that what you're saying you're going to do, you've provided funding for. Right? If you say you're going to give every kid a, um, you know, a snack right, after, uh, in the after school program, well, there should be money in there somewhere for apples and you know, granola bars or whatever it is. Right? Um, again, different organizations will have different specificity levels that they want. Um, but generally, you, you would always want to make sure your narrative and your budget are uh, in line with one another, right? And it's easier than you would think to forget things, right? Um, yeah? If you're, if you're applying for just a small grant, mm -hmm. you don't expect to cover your funding and have other funding things, you still write a budget for the full program or just? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, oh, sorry. So the question was, if you're writing a grant and maybe you're not expecting this one organization to cover the whole thing, but it's going to contribute to the costs, um, that depends on the organization. But generally, what you do is you submit a full project budget and you might say uh, in what's called the budget justification, where you explain everything, you might say, you know, X Foundation's grant will cover, you know, bus transport and or whatever else it would be, right? So. Um, generally, they like to see how all the pieces fit together and then how they slot in there. But then some organizations may just want it, you know, very individual, uh, individually laid out. Um, yeah, good question. And then last again, how do you know it worked, right? What are your criteria for success, right? Now, this may be, you know, it, this can vary really widely. It can be, you know, uh, that uh, um, attendees to the exhibit, uh, you know, gave feedback that reflected that they had, you know, rethought the history of, uh, you know, uh, ex parish, right, whatever, you know, the name of it is, and, and or that they had had a new perspective on these events, or that, uh, um, you know, we had 25 children who attended, uh, you know, the program, um, you know, it, it can be a lot of different things, but, it, it, and they just want to know how are you evaluating, right, whether or not the program was a success. So, you, you know, you, you want to think about that. Um, so those are your basic elements. Now, when you get into um, uh, the actual, uh, um, when you get into the actual preparation of, uh, of these narratives, right? Um, I, I, I always think of this as remembering the brown M&Ms um, or what Van Halen can teach you about grant writing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, for you young people, Van Halen was a rock band, right? Uh, um, that uh, was popular many years ago when that man was much younger than he is now and much skinnier. Um, and uh, um, but there was this story that went around in the '80s um, that uh, Van Halen was you know, at one time one of the biggest rock bands in the world, right? That uh, um, they were so entitled and so spoiled and uh, um, particular, uh, you know that they had a, a clause in their contract that in the backstage catering area, there couldn't be any brown M&Ms. And so, you know, the, the, um, 
production company would have to actually pay someone to go through and pick out all the brown M&Ms from the bowls of M&Ms um, just because these people are so, you know, uh, uh, you, you entitled, right? Um, and so this was, in fact, a real thing, right? Uh, um, in the, uh, the concert rider, so Van Halen was coming to Lafayette, Louisiana, right? Um, they would send ahead to the venue and the production company that was setting up the concert. Um, here's what we want, right? We want all these things. All these things need to be backstage on the catering tables, right? This was also accompanied by all of the very specific instructions about how the stage was to be constructed, right? And so, yeah, here it is, right? M&M's, warning, absolutely no brown ones, right? <laughs> well, so you, you may have heard this since, but the, the story has come out that in fact, the purpose, that the, the brown M&M's had a purpose. Um, the idea was that if the band went into the backstage area uh, the day of the show and they saw M&M's and the brown ones weren't picked out, right? What did that mean? What's that? They didn't, follow they didn't follow instructions, okay? Which like if you, you know, when it comes to M&Ms and you maybe they didn't get all the assorted dips for the potato chips or whatever else, right? But when it comes to M&Ms, who really cares? But what they were concerned about was Van Halen was putting on these shows that were at the time some of the most complex in terms of stage construction. Um, so David Lee Roth there would have, he had this wire that was rigged up and so he would leap into the air and the cable would pull him up, right? Um, and there would be these pyrotechnics, there would be complex audio and electrical systems running, the stage had to be constructed to bear weight in certain points, and this is all specified in the contract, right? So David Lee Roth later said, if we went in and there were brown M&Ms, we trashed the place because we knew that they hadn't read the contract closely and we could be in danger. The cable could break when I'm you know, 15 feet up in the air, right? Because they haven't done it right. They haven't set up the stage right, right? So that's a long, complicated story. To, all to say, <laughs> all to say um, you really want to follow the guidelines uh, for grant applications really, really specifically. And you want to pay attention to the details of um, the criteria that uh, a given uh, organization has, right? Because these organizations get lots of really worthy projects, right? They get uh, lots of uh, really great proposals from really good-hearted people that want to do really interesting things, um, but uh, they have to eliminate some, and it's really easy to eliminate the ones that didn't follow instructions, right? If they see brown M&Ms, they can just cut it out and go on to the ones that did, right? So, um, <clears throat> I'll give you some examples here. Geographic focus area, right? What areas, uh, you know, is the, is the organization focused on the city limits of Lafayette? Or is it focused on a couple of parishes? Or is it focused on the state of Louisiana? Or is it focused on the, you know, the Gulf Shores region or whatever, right? Um, what is their geographic focus? What are their um, areas of, of uh, focus in terms of uh, um, uh, you know, what kinds of programming? What limitations do they have? So for example, a lot of organizations will say, we'll give you money for physical infrastructure, right? We'll re help you replace the windows or whatever, um, but we're not paying for staffing, right? Or <laughs> we'll pay for staffing and programming, but we're not doing physical infrastructure, right? So you can save yourself a lot of time by paying really close attention to the guidelines. And so, and, and this can also go down to, if you get a grant, how does the organization want to be acknowledged? So we had, uh, um, you know, uh, the introduction here in which, you know, the organizations who supported the, the speaker series were acknowledged, right? So that often is set into the guidelines, right? If you fund an event with our money, we would like you to say thank you to X Foundation, right? Um, and I'll give you some uh, examples here we can look at in particular. Um, this one is fascinating to me. Uh, so this is an organization in Pittsburgh um, called the McCune Foundation. Um, it was, uh, uh, it's a little known, uh, it's very relatively obscure foundation, um, but it gives out a pile of money. Um, I'll uh, show you, that's a technical term, pile. Um, uh, so this is a private foundation 
that uh, was established by um, uh, Charles L. McCune in 1979. He was the director of the Union National Bank for Pits in Pittsburgh for 56 years. Um, so if we go to their annual reports, um, which outline, this is also a very useful thing to do. If you can find out, if you can get an annual report or a past grantees report where they, you see what kinds of things they've given money to, this is helpful, right? Um, so uh, they um, paid out last year $290 million um, in grants, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, or, excuse me, maybe I'm reading that wrong. Let's see. Oh, assets, payout scenario. Okay, they give a whole lot of money. Again, it's a pile. It's a technical term. Um, but uh, that actually may be a correct number. I mean, so here they gave $2 million to Action Housing, which works towards uh, um, housing availability in Pittsburgh, right? They gave a uh, million five to the National Aviary in Pittsburgh that, in a year. They gave out two and a half million to the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. They gave a half a million dollars to Pittsburgh Botanical Gardens, right? That's only one category. Um, and so you get the idea, right? Uh, all sorts of different uh, things. Okay, so um, it's very interesting. So they have a um, very specific area that they fund, right? Here are the counties we will fund grants in, no others. It doesn't matter if you're right here on the edge of Bedford County, yeah, we're done, right? Yeah. So this is important to pay attention to. What's the geographic focus? So let's say they say, um, you know, uh, uh, in, in my case, Western Pennsylvania. Well, what do they mean by Western Pennsylvania, right? Well, in this case, it's very specific. They also have um, uh, an interesting policy um, they have a publicity policy uh, in which they, uh, in fact, do not want uh, any acknowledgement to be given. Right? So they don't want anyone to know that they funded anything. So if you got a grant from them and you stuck a big plaque up on the wall saying, thank you to the McCune Foundation, and then you announced it when you had a speaker series that you paid for from that money, they're going to be really ticked off and you're never getting money from them again even though that seems like the really polite, nice thing to do, right? <laughs> and you would think, well, I'm sure they want to be acknowledged, right? Well, no, they don't, right? It's the brown M&Ms again. So it's those kind of details that, uh, um, you know, can often surprise you. Um, and they, they are very specific. Do not name scholarship funds, right? Never list the foundation's name and the amount of the grant. Um, all these kinds of things. <clears throat> so then they give you uh, also here um, very specific types of organizations that they want to fund, the categories um, that they want to fund. Um, you know, and we approached the McCune Foundation because they had a, um, they had a policy, they don't fund any publicly funded uh, organizations. And yet at the same time, there were some organizations on there that seemed kind of publicly funded, right? Um, so I approached them and you know, kind of laid out the things that we're doing. Uh, yeah, and then I got an email back that said, you are welcome to apply, period, <laughs> right? Which to me was, you don't have a chance to this, you know, whatever it is about the state university or something, they were not interested, right? I mean, it was a very like, I can't tell you not to apply, but I'm not going to encourage it, right? But it was good that I did that, that I reached out first, okay, let's go look elsewhere rather than writing a big proposal for them and wasting our time. Uh, sorry, you had a yeah. question. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the publicity policy, but what it says, it said like we don't want any acknowledgement. So what do you do if you get money from them, but you have to list it as part of another budget problem, but they don't want you to, they don't want you to acknowledge them. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's directed more towards any sort of, um, uh, you know, publicity around it, right? So I think there's somewhere in there where they say, uh, what you may do, you may list the name uh, in an annual report, major campaigns, you may verbally mention the name of the foundation during your solicitation of other foundations. So I think there, if you were saying, okay, in, in, a, in a private application, you could say that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, uh, and then so there's, you know, there's things like the publicity policies, the, the geographic areas, 
Here's another, uh, I'm sorry, I wish I had you know, local examples. Uh, if I'd really done my homework, I guess I could have done that to find them. These are the ones I'm familiar with uh, from Western Pennsylvania. Um, so the Grable Foundation, which is one of our partners, um, uh, so here are their criteria, right? So um, you can see right off the bat, they have uh, attention to kids whose opportunities are limited due to economic circumstances. We support A, early learning and development, B, enhanced learning in public school classrooms, C, out of school time learning, family and caregiver learning support, and vibrant places that contribute positively to kids' learning and well being. Okay, so they're all about kids, right? But then they have these different venues. Um, they also say here we can't accept proposals from organizations outside of the area, right? Uh, and they don't cover indirect or uh, administrative cost assessments, these kinds of things. They only meet three times a year. So you have to pay attention to deadlines, right? Um, just being aware of, okay, well, um, they're meeting in March, so I need to submit something January 1st and then the full proposal by February 1st, right? Paying attention to those things is uh, um, uh, important, right? Um, and then again, here they also have, and they expand on their uh, areas of focus uh, here so that they tell you more about what they mean about each one of them. I won't go into that, but then again, very useful. They, they publicize uh, what you know, some of their recent grants have gone to, right? So you get a sense of uh, the types of organizations they're giving to. Um, uh, you know, there's some really interesting things in here, right? Before we got a grant from the Grable Foundation, I saw that they gave money to uh, the YMCA for a fly fishing program. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Give me some money, I'm trying to help kids here. You know, <laughs> um, everybody always thinks their program is the really special one, right? Um, but uh, uh, so this can give you a good sense. Are we a good fit, right? Um, and again, that contact with organizations is, uh, is really valuable. Uh, questions here so far? Right, so, let me back over here. Okay, well, that's enough of David Lee Roth. All right, well, uh, um, so, uh, when you're thinking about, so let's say you have the parameters, right? Uh, um, uh, you have the, uh, um, you know this is a good fit, you know the deadlines, right? You're ready to roll, okay? Um, you've, you've kind of reviewed the application, what they tell you to do in each one. Just some basic um, points here that I, I would make. Good writing is really, really important, right? Luckily, you history grad students, right? Uh, you're writing all the freaking time, right? Uh, um, and then, you know, your professors are not uh, letting you off the hook easily. They make you write better, right? No, this, this is still really unclear. You need to revise this. We're gonna revise and revise and revise and revise. It's such great training when you get to uh, writing a grant, right? Being able to say something really effectively, specifically, in a focused way, in a nicely structured way, um, uh, gets you so much farther ahead of the pack, right? Uh, um, uh, so, you know, you know, I am the procrastinator extraordinaire, but do not wait until the night before the deadline and try to throw something together, right? You need a draft, right? You need drafts. You need multiple drafts. Also, by the way, um, one of the things to ask if you're applying to an agency is, um, would, you, would you be able to review a, a uh, rough draft, right? If I were to put together a proposal and submit it, say, a month ahead, is there someone at the agency, at the foundation, that could give me feedback on it, right? So we did that on a in a few uh, cases. Um, uh, you know, so making sure that it's uh, as effective as possible um, find good writers, um, you know, it, 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 in cases if you have someone you really trust, uh, it might be worth paying them. Look, I'll pay you a hundred bucks, clean this thing up, right? Uh, <laughs> make me look good. Um, the second thing I will say is that a lot of organizations make the mistake of um, talking in their uh, LOIs or their proposals about how much they need, how much they are in need, okay? so they're, we're just a little small museum, right? We can barely even pay the electric bill. Um, so we really need this money so we can start this new program, right? Uh, or to hire a new person, right? Um, uh, and that seems instinctually kind of right off the cuff. Like, oh yeah, we need to show them like we really need money, right? Um, and in fact, I'm on the board of a county historical society um, in Pennsylvania. And 
at our last meeting, the sort of trust, uh, the treasurer's report went around, right? And we kind of reviewed everything. And, you know, this is how much we have in reserves in the bank. And somebody said, well, we need to make sure that doesn't get too big because uh, we go to apply for grants. They're going to say, you don't need any money. And I, I, I said, I, hold on, uh, just if I could. <laughs> um, psychologically, organizations want to bet on a winner, right? You, you don't want to bet on the horse that's crippled and, uh, you know, 20 years old and uh, um, you know, may fall down right out of the gate, right? You want to you wanna see potential. Now, that doesn't mean you have to lie, right? Um, but it means that you want to demonstrate stability. You want to demonstrate what you do successfully, okay? Um, so if you are a small museum uh, with limited staffing, um, what can you point to that says that you, do, what do you do well, right? And then, I'm not asking for something that I need from you. I'm providing you an opportunity to partner, right? We are going to do this thing that is going to, you know, build community, that is going to provide opportunities for people, that's going to enhance our exhibits or whatever, um, and we'd like you to partner with us, right? You, see, you hear the difference there, right? Oh, we're in desperate need or, oh, we, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we really, uh, we have, we do some things well, we want to do them better, right? So, um, uh, let me go back here. Um, actually, we'll, we'll go here. So, uh, I'm going to give us an example LOI. Um, and you can tell me what things it doesn't do well, right? Since we're, uh, it's topically appropriate, we'll switch back to David Lero. Did everyone get a copy? I had a few more here. Oh, sorry. So look at it first, read it, and then uh, talk to the person next to you about uh, what uh, the LOI, the way it could be improved. All right, so what are some things uh, that you see here? This is goofy. I made it up, right? There's no real, well, there probably is a museum of metal history somewhere, but, uh, um, and Morgan J. Dingus is a guy I went to college with, and I just I always liked his name, and it stuck in my head. Um, but, but this is actually adapted from a real one that I didn't want, I wasn't going to share, you know, because I don't want to, like, you know, implicate the institution, right? But, uh, um, so I've swapped out some things. But what are some, what are some issues you see here? you guys identified well at, at first they, they just flat out start requesting money from the very beginning they don't mm -hmm. like they're just like we need this twenty thousand dollars they they're not going through and saying like what who they are and the the need okay. and everything good so. yeah so they haven't even introduced themselves right um they're just assuming you know who they are right good yeah First, I love this activity. Um, <laughs> and now I want to go back through all of my LOIs yeah. and think more carefully about them. Um, so just in looking at keywords, if you were to go through and just highlight basic ones, I see poor facilities, limited budget, mm -hmm. um, poor condition, rapid mainstreaming, meaning they're out of date, mm -hmm. um, and interest in supporting, which is passive and not, um, not collaborative, right? Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. So the verbs, right? There, we're requesting. We're requesting. We have a limited budget, right? Um, uh, there, you know, we have things that are in poor condition, right? Uh, um, and so uh, there's a lot of emphasis on need, right? And things aren't going well here, and we really need your money, because the question then for the organization becomes, well, sure, everyone would like to rush in and be the savior, right? But what happens when our money is spent? How is the organization sustainable, right? Is it going to be able to support itself or is it, are they just going to come back and ask for more money just to keep the doors open, right? Um, good, other things that you see here. Yeah, go. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the 
Don't let the faculty talk. If they talk enough. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yeah, right, exactly. It seems not to be maybe, we don't know what the Rainbow and Butterflies Foundation is, but seems like maybe that's not the best fit, right? Maybe it would be, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the foundation would be that would, you know, give money to the Metal History Museum. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a, and it, it, at the very least you could say they don't explain how what they want to do fits with the priorities of the Rainbow and Butterflies Foundation, right? Okay, good, yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, right. So they say something in the middle there about uh, um, uh, this gonna expand our student program. You know, what students, college students, right? Elementary students, how many? Right, uh, um, what's your kind of connection? What's your capacity? What's your plan to expand that? Right, uh, yeah. So I, I guess my statement is also a question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> classic academic. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, can everybody hear me? Oh, this is better. Um, yeah, for the recording, yeah, I think that's. How, how does one show need for windows for their thrash metal exhibit, <laughs> uh -huh. right? Yeah. And this is a, the difficulty is I read it, I think, I, I don't know why they need the windows other than mm -hmm. they've got bad windows. Yeah, right. So, so it seems like a real difficulty moving forward. Yeah, no, it, it, it could be, right? Uh, um, and again, that would go back to also evaluating whether your, uh, um, that organization wants to fund infrastructure. But here I had a sample and my a animation timing got screwed up. But um, so let's imagine this scenario, right? Um, so this might be a way you might do it, right? Uh, um, this, uh, this windows will ensure a climate controlled environment for our collections, right? And so then um, that'll reduce our costs for artifact maintenance, repair and replacement by a, around 2000 per year. And it will reduce our utility costs by nearly 20%, a total savings of $5,000 annually. And then we can take that money because um, our education directors already drafted a proposal to use that $5,000 to uh, um, expand a, uh, um, uh, a children's summer education initiative, right? Up. I'm making this up. Um, so, but you can see what are the what are the qualities that make that stronger? Specificity. Yes, specificity, right? Um, and also the question of um, so what, right? So, what you're spending the money on isn't the end. Right, that's not the thing. The thing is what you're spending the money on, what will that enable you to do? How will that enable you to build on your mission, right? So even something as seemingly boring and you know, non-mission focused as new windows, you can take that and say, you know, this, and it doesn't have to be then you're building a new program out of it, but this will reduce our operational overhead and allow us to pursue um, a better exhibit design or whatever you wanna say, right? Um, so that you are giving a sense of how the outcome is, uh, um, is matching the mission of the organization, right? So there, maybe you could apply to the Rainbow Butterflies Foundation if they are focused on children and uh, education enhancement, right? And maybe you have a program that's, you know, using music and learning about metal and playing metal to help children with, uh, you know, uh, emotional uh, disorders, right? behavioral disorders and things, right? I don't know, but whatever. But you're saying, okay, here's how this money will then help advance our mission and match with what you do, right? So in a lot of ways, it's like, figure out what motivates your audience, right? Figure out what they're excited about. And then figure out how and if your mission also aligns, right? Other, other points here, other questions? So what about you do all this, right? You're specific, right? You, you're detailed, you align with the mission, the geographic area, all these kind of things. And then you send it in and they're like, we, we've received many, if you, if you ever get a letter that says we've received many worthy proposals this year, you just close, close it up and go back to the drawing board, right? Uh, you don't even have to read farther. Um, but um, so it's probably going to fail. Um, 
Not all of them, but many of them will. Okay? Um, fail is a bad word. It uh, will not be funded. We'll say that. Okay? So we first applied um, to the Grable Foundation. Uh, we sent an LOI to the Grable Foundation the first time around, um, actually before we had received the NEH grant. And we got the we've received many worthy proposals this year, right? Um, but what we, what we did there is we kept that relationship going, right? So you don't take that letter and say, well, screw you, and dump it and go on to something else, right? No, you say, OK, just because they didn't fund it doesn't mean they didn't like it. It may mean that they had other commitments, multi-year grants that they're already giving, so they had a limited pool, right? It may mean that uh, the people on their board for that year are focused on very specific things, right? So I had a meeting with the um, Heinz Foundation in, in Pittsburgh, um, and uh, the woman said, do you want to buy the kids iPads? Because my board loves buying kids iPads right now. Like, they just think iPads sol solve everything, right? And I was like, we don't want to buy them iPads. And she's like, yeah, probably not right now. You know? <laughs> um, they were very into buying technology and the whole STEM thing and all this, right? So um, it may just be that the makeup of the board for that term or whatever just has a particular focus or interest or weird obsession, right? Um, so it may not mean your proposal is bad. But talk to them. Hey. Uh, are you able to share reviewer comments, right? Uh, could I see those? That'd be great, right? Um, uh, we did, so we did that with Grable. We didn't get the Grable one. We also, in the same year, applied to NEH the first time, and we didn't get the NEH grant either, right? So we really were feeling pretty low on ourselves, right? 0 for 2 here, right? Um, but we got feedback. The NEH will provide you. So the way the NEH grants work is they go in to um, uh, there's a panel of external reviewers. So there are several, for one grant, there can be multiple panels, right? Um, and then they may review 12 to 15 different grant proposals, and they all give a grade um, from excellent to very good to good to some merit, which I think is such a like, you know, uh, dismissive phrase. There's something here. There are words on these pages. Um, but, uh, and then they have to fill in and answer certain questions, right? Well, that information, you can request it from the NEH and they'll share it with you. They don't tell you who the reviewers are, but you get all that feedback. That was tremendously helpful, right? What it told us is that the reviewers felt like what we wanted to do was a little too scattered. It wasn't focused enough, right? That they, we didn't have a um, strong enough plan for how the money was going to um, be matched, right? Um, that was a little too vague. And so we were able to take that and incorporate it around the next time, right? So don't get your feelings hurt if it doesn't succeed, right? Just say, okay, what can I learn, right? Um, keep that relationship going, right, um, in a friendly way, because that does help, right? Uh, it does help sort of just understand the organization. They understand you. They understand you're committed, right? You're coming back. You're persistent, right? Um, a lot of times it helps to find a partner, right? If granting organizations see that you have another organization in your community, let's say, that is gonna go in with you to build a program or to, to uh, carry out something, right? Um, or that you are able to dedicate some of your own resources to it, right? So we've committed 20% you know, of the total budget to this project for the next year. We've partnered also with, you know, the, uh, um, with the Metal History Museum. Uh, we're gonna be doing collaborative programming, um, providing letters of support. If, again, if the grant guidelines permit this, <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, so for example, in our second round, because one of the questions of the reviewers was, well, how much are, uh, you know, how much is the administrative administration of the university supportive of this, right? How much are the other community partners buying into this? So we got additional statements of support from our provost, from our president, from the schools, uh, from the uh, principal at one of the high schools, right? So this bolstered the case that, oh yeah, everybody's on the same page here, right? And you've got a good partnership. And, you know, try again, right? Now, again, you may, when you reach out and you get the decline, and you reach out to uh, one of the uh, program officers or something, they may say, you know, this really didn't fit uh, what, what we're looking for. And it's not gonna be a matter of tweaking it, it really just is a little farther away from our mission than we can fund, right? Great. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it, because you may want to go back to them again, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
Right, so you're talking about other members of the community or like the university having uh, like letters of support. Yeah. Um, would they? Would that be included with the application, or do they send that separately? So generally, they would give that to you, uh, and you would submit it. Uh, a lot of times, there's a um, a place for like supporting materials or an appendix or something where you're adding stuff that isn't really part of the main application, but it helps them understand uh, the context and the partnerships you you have. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, and then you're uh, you're trying again, right? The the persistence uh, is uh, is an important part of it, right? Um, I'll leave you with a few other things here, and then I would love to uh, you know have discussion and, and dialogue about this. Um, uh, so, one of the key things that I've really learned, I was told this beforehand, but I didn't really uh, totally sort of it didn't sink into my understanding of things until much later, is that. Um, you really want to be careful to not let money drive your mission, right? So this is this is kind of a um, nonprofit fundraising, uh, one of the core principles. And what I mean by that is, you know, if uh, if you hear someone on your board or you know in your staff or wherever say, oh well, that's this they don't really have money for this, but if we changed it and we did this instead, then we could get money, right? That's a problem. Okay, because what the organization needs to do is figure out who they are, what they do, right, and then go find people who can um, support that and who want to support that, right? Um, because what happens then is you start changing things around, and suddenly you don't really know who you are, but you're funded, right, and you're doing things that don't really make much sense for your organization, right? And I've seen this happen, and frankly, it happened a little bit to us. Um, the original vision for uh, the Humanities Ladder um, was that it was going to be an adult uh, education uh, program that uh, adults 18 to 35 who were, um, you know, had income below the poverty line. It was going to be, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Clemente course in the humanities, uh, but this is uh, a university level seminar style um, year long course in philosophy, art history and aesthetics, U.S. history, um, I think rhetoric and something else. Um, and that's what we wanted to do, right? We didn't have any money yet, right? And we went to the provost and said, hey, we want to do this thing, right? Uh, he said, I can't justify giving you any of the money for that. I do have money for high school students and for um, uh, you know, diversity money, right? So if you've got uh, high schools that have a high uh, population uh, of you know, uh, racial minorities, then I can say I'm going to give you the money for this, right? And that also sounded really cool to us and was pretty closely aligned. And we you know, started doing the research more on, again, the obstacles that first generation, low income uh, students of color often face or just first generation, low income, whatever. Um, and so that, that ended up, but that's also presented challenges working with the school districts. We work with two different high schools and their priorities and their schedules and a guidance counselor who really supported the program, who then retired, and a new one who doesn't really as much, right? And so I, then I say, like, I take my own advice, right? Okay, well, maybe we should have said, no, we want to be about this. And we're going to find the money somewhere else first, right? And, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing, right? I'll be honest with you. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a, it's a lesson in terms of uh, um, learning from your mistakes. Um, if your organization or your future organization has a board, they need to be doing stuff, right? Um, the rule, you know, the, the, the sort of standard maxim is uh, they need to contribute at least one of the three W's, right? Wisdom, wealth, or work, right? So they need to like show up and volunteer and do stuff. They need to be, uh, have insight that, you know, is not, uh, um, you know, everyone doesn't have, they've got some experience or something. Or they need to be able to give money or find people who give money, right? And you can tell them this. I want you to be on the board because you have money uh, and you know people who have money. And maybe you know people at X Foundation, right? Those relationships are really important. So being kind of shameless about asking for money is actually important too. I'm like, no, I really believe in what we're doing. Like, you know, I think there's money out there for it and I think you ought to support it because it does these things, right? Developing that kind of idea of the elevator pitch, right? We're in a minute you could tell what your organization does and why it's really great, right? 
um, is really valuable. So if you have a board member, they, you know, they need to be doing one of these three. They, they bear responsibility for um, at least uh, contributing to fundraising and sustainability of your organization. Uh, the relationships, again, Another thing that I see a lot of, at least in my area, a lot of organizations do is they try to fundraise through sort of retail models and uh, event models, right? And this is not to um, disparage all of those, right? Uh, a lot of people have an annual um, charity banquet, right? Or a fundraising banquet or an event. Um, or maybe you have something that you sell that people buy a lot of and you make a lot of money off of it, right? But events and retail fundraising are um, difficult to sustain long term because they uh, require a lot of work, right? So to put on some big uh, event, right, can take a lot of work from your volunteers and your staff, right? Can be exhausting to coordinate, to uh, make sure you've got all the programming going, you've got the catering and you've got this and you've got that and you're setting up chairs and you're running around like crazy, you know, and you made $800. Well, you ought to have somebody on your board that could write a check for $800 without too much warning, right? Or you got to have somebody on your board that uh, knows somebody or knows somebody at a local area community uh, foundation that could get you a grant for a thousand bucks, right? And then maybe we don't have to spend all of our energy around this event. Um, you know, when, when you look at the sort of cost benefit analysis, right? And often you're very off mission, right? So. This is happening now, in a, you know, think about beyond the small scale, the large scale, Colonial Williamsburg uh, is actually suffering from this a lot right now. Um, so Colonial Williamsburg has now um, gone to this model of, uh, and there's a lot of people, not to get too in, inside baseball with public history, but there's a lot of people analyzing their kind of management that are saying it's really poorly managed and they're spending way too much on their fundraising efforts than they're actually able to bring in. They're not very efficient in that, right? Um, but now they've got an ice skating rink that they, you know, you can pay to go ice skating. There's, you know, ax throwing. There's, uh, um, there's this whole Halloween thing where they've got, you know, colonial zombies and all this, you know, and you can say, oh, well, that's fun, whatever, right? But you're really getting away from your mission. You're getting away from education. Right? You're getting away from engaging people with the significance of the past. Right? You're turning into a theme park. Right? Um, and that, you know, so I, I think that's a really problematic way. And, and you know, sometimes you have to say, well, this is the only way we can raise money to do X. Well, maybe you don't need to do X. Right? Maybe you, you pare down what you're focused on, focus in on one, two, three things, and then build from there. Right? If you don't have the sustained funding to keep up something and you're spending all your effort, you know, um, selling, uh, you know, raffle tickets or, or whatever to, to raise, um, you know, some money. And again, I don't mean to disparage that because that's a tremendous amount of work and people are showing initiative and creativity and entrepreneurial, uh, you know, kind of approach. And I, I get that. I, it's, it's, uh, I've seen it burn people out pretty consistently in terms of small historical organizations, museums and that kind of thing. Um, and the final thing I'll say here is modesty will get you nowhere. <laughs> um, uh, when you have successes, uh, tell that story, right? Um, so it's worth spending some time becoming relatively proficient in social media. It's worth spending the time to think about, hey, we do this, uh, um, we do this annual uh, homebrewed history event or whatever. Let's get a videographer out here and spend a couple hundred bucks and film this and interview some people and put together a three minute video about it, right? Um, let's find ways to uh, um, tell our story in ways that uh, people can connect to. Because this has a snowball effect, right? Oh yeah, I mean, we've all seen the things that people share on social media and they go, uh, viral and then your aunt's sharing this thing and then your friend's sharing this thing and then there's this whole uh, effect here, right? I'm not a huge fan of social media, but it is pretty effective in kind of engaging a lot of people, right? And, and it's a tool that we as public historians have to know how to use, have to be proficient in, have to be um, uh, to some degree at least. You don't, you, know, you don't have to be on Instagram and whatever else I'm too old to know about now. but um, uh, you know, you should have some 
you know, uh, the, the County Historical Society in my county doesn't even have a Facebook page, right? I mean, that, that's like ancient social media, right? Um, uh, you know, they don't, they don't list their events on their website, right? <laughs> um, so thinking about ways to tell your story that are really interesting, you know, so there are models out there, museums that I've seen, for example, will take an artifact and once a week, they take a picture of an artifact, they break down something interesting about it. Get a photograph from your collections and share it out there with people, a really interesting one, right? Um, uh, and again, putting together um, some kind of uh, way that you can share your message. I'll, I'll give you, so we've done this, um, uh, so I'll share the, uh, um, we created a, a trailer for the Humanities Ladder that uh, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope will work. Um, eh, let's see, well, I can do this. Oh. It would help if I could spell. Um, yeah, okay, here we go. The Humanities Ladder is a program to bring college level humanities content into high school classrooms to help prepare them for college. The Humanities Ladder right now is in two high schools. One is Aliquippa High School, which is in Beaver County, and the other is in Union Area High School, which is just outside of Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And both of these towns are really, unfortunately, sort of typical Western Pennsylvania ex-industrial towns. So the populations have shrunk, and the school districts uh, don't have a lot of money. As a result, the student bodies at these two schools um, end up isolated from cultural centers and from opportunities that other students in wealthier school districts would be able to experience. It made college seem like a less scary place, especially for someone who's never really been introduced to that before as a sophomore. So it made college seem more approachable. It really helped to get into that college Nikki mindset. You know, being a college student, having Dr. Perry here, you know, students think doctor, oh, that's scary, but she's just an everyday person too. So it kind of helps, you know, bridge the gap and make students realize that college isn't this scary place that like students and professors are just like you. Before I thought the program was just really good, someone would be coming in and boring, just talking to us the whole time. But once I started actually being involved in the program, it was a lot of fun and I would recommend anyone else. So that was, uh, um, that was uh, you know, I think that cost us 300 bucks. Yeah, but we found a videographer who was kind of up and coming and she was really talented and she said, you know, I, I need stuff from our portfolio, 300 bucks. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's two minutes. It says what we do, right? Oh, oh, that's weird. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I hate autoplay. But uh, this is the curse every time I teach. Right? And, um, okay, so yeah, I mean, it says what we do, what we're about. Um, you've got interviews, testimonials, right? Uh, um, you get some visual sense in your mind of what's going on, right? Got a few stats in there, indicators of success. Acknowledge your granting organizations at the end. Thank you, thank you, right? Two minutes. So, and that's something that, again, tells the story. Um, so, you know, think about ways to do that. It doesn't have to be a video, right? It can be lots of other things, but share the successes so that then, again, you're much more likely to have um, organizations that want to um, partner with you when they, they've heard about your success. They know it. They've, uh, um, they've seen uh, some examples of it themselves. Um, so uh, that's... Uh, um, that's my spiel, I guess. Um, I'd be, uh, let's, I'd, I'd love to talk more and answer questions um, or people to share kind of your experiences in terms of 
grant writing, and uh, um, uh, we'll make Julia run around. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay, I'm gonna start, because uh, I actually have a, a local example of a grant that oh, yeah. is open right now until May 10th. Oh, great, okay, um, cool. Yeah. And it's offered through the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, mm -hmm. uh, who got a National Endowment for the Humanities larger grant. Sure. Um, and so they're looking to offer, uh, and maybe you could put it up on the screen. Oh, sure, yeah, I'll do that. So if you just Google Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, it'll pop up, uh, mm -hmm. and then you can go to their main page and then look for the emergency grants. And I mention this because it is due by next Friday, um, but it might affect people in the room, uh, and it's a really good example of a smaller grant um, that maybe we could get your advice or help on, because uh, sure. there could be people in here that could apply for it. It's loading. If you scroll down just slightly, uh, keep going a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. There, the National Endowment for the Humanity, er, right there, Grant. that yeah, one. Great. Yep. Oh, by the way, I'll also add here. Um, so the state humanities councils often have grants workshops um, where you get much more in depth than than uh, some of the stuff I'm running through here. So that's those are really really helpful and they're free. Um, you just you know you have to register. Um, that's a so this is a, a grant for anybody who was affected by Hurricane Harvey uh, so institutions or archives um, within the region uh, and it's specifically for the 12 parishes that were declared federal disaster zones so that includes the list there Acadia, Allen, Beauregard, Calcasieu, Cameron, Iberia, Jefferson Davis, Natchitoches, Rap Rapides, Sabine, Vernon uh, and Vermilion parishes so that's quite a long list there right um, but they have ranges of 500 to five thousand dollars and it's meant to support institutions that are trying to get back on their feet this is something new that the NEH is looking to do um, in various communities affected by disasters since this series is archives in crisis and our theme this week is how to apply for grants um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the process of applying for a rapid response grant like this uh, to a recent disaster where maybe you have been struggling with the recovery efforts and you see this grant pop up and there's a limited amount of time to do it uh, you know like how would you approach the process of writing a grant like this um, for your institution that is in crisis at that moment or shortly after the crisis has occurred yeah yeah that's a great question um, obviously I don't have any direct experience with that but I think the first thing I would do is I would dial 504-620-2639 I want to talk to that guy okay so I want to know um, at, you know look over the stuff really quickly right look through the guidelines and then immediately because there's just going to be things that um, that program officer is going to be able to tell you about the grant that you want to think about before you get started or that it may seem you you may interpret um, something uh, you know to be much more complicated than what they really want or something like that. Uh, in a in a case like that where you're talking about rapid response, I would I would just make contact as quickly as possible so that um, you're on the radar and kinds of just awareness of what's coming in. In a case like this, you may not have a lot of time to submit a, um, a draft, but uh, you know what you can hey this is our situation does that sound like something that we should submit an application for right um, so that would be my um, uh, you know and, and I'm imagining that they've um, that they've uh, um, got a relatively you know, in terms of the guidelines that they have a relatively brief uh, narrative uh, I don't know if it's in here and specifically on this page but Oh yeah, there we go. Right. So, um, oh yeah, then you have to do the whole log on. But you know, anyway, I'm imagining it's fairly pared down. I mean, the the narrative for uh, an NEH grant used to be 30, 50, 70 pages. I mean, some of the, I've seen examples that are just unbelievable. Right. Um, with our grant, they told us five single space pages. That's all you got. Right. Um, you know, and that was a pretty major grant. So I'm you know I'm thinking this is pretty short right and, and, and you know approachable um, 
So yeah, that, that would be my advice, is to contact them uh, right with, for the LEH uh, right away, just to see what, you, what more you can find out. Yeah. I want to ask a follow-up question connected to that, because I know that a lot of people, um, their first inclination is to send an email. Yeah. But you didn't say, I'm going to email Chris. Right. You said, I'm going to pick up the phone and dial 504. So can yeah. you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, um, it just quicker. And it's, you know, I think all of us have had the experience of getting buried behind on emails. And it's just much easier to, not purposely, uh, but much easier to ignore that person who emails, right? And then just like, well, I didn't hear back from them, so I guess they don't care. And it's like, well, you know. People get slammed with these things, especially in a case like this, where you're talking about a short time frame, something announced to deal with um, disaster, right? So um, again, that personal contact is, it just saves you time. I mean, you could trade six emails and basically answer the questions you could have had in a five minute phone call, right? Um, and, uh, um, and that's what they're there for. I mean, they're not like, oh, I'm doing other stuff, leave me alone. Right? I mean, that, their whole point is to facilitate uh, you know, grant applications and the distribution of grants. So they, they're, you know, I mean, that was, you know, a little like, uh, um, it's funny, like, you're like, oh, I've been around, I've done stuff in the world, I'm not, and then I'm like, I'm calling the NEH, right? And I was like, I'm getting nervous. Why am I getting nervous? You know, it's like, this is stupid. But, uh, um, but I mean, it, they're perfectly nice, right? And it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal. But, um, so yeah, just, just making that contact, I think is just more efficient and faster and yeah helpful to them, frankly, because I think most people would rather do that on the phone. I think another thing on there, it says that it's uh, how to prepare for the disaster. So, oh, okay. yeah. so if you need to buy your disaster response kits or uh, yeah. anything else, I mean, this is a good opportunity for it. Right, right, sure. Um, some of this can even be about documentation, right? So. Um, uh, and then uh, programming around that, all kinds of things. And this again, this, uh, this is LEH, but it reflects a lot of the, um, the shift in approach for NEH, which is about what our community needs, right? What are, wh what's out there that, you know, general needs in any given community and how can the humanities help address some of those things, right? And so um, I, that's exciting to see. So could you talk a little bit about, you mentioned you'll call somebody mm -hmm. or so on when you're looking for the grant, but yep. you also mentioned that if a grant isn't initially funded, you'll mm -hmm. keep in contact with people. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit just in practical terms about the types of conversations you have and the ways you look to build and maintain relationships even when they're not funded? Sure, yeah. Um, so one would again, be doing that uh, follow-up contact right after the after the letter you know hey I was disappointed to see that but I certainly understand um, and just confirming with them you know uh, would uh, would be able would be interested in seeing an application next year um, and uh, um, you know just courtesy goes a long way I mean you'd be amazed about how many people don't do the common sense courtesy right uh, you'd be amazed how many people get grants and then don't thank the funding organizations, right? Don't do those kinds of things, and when they're supposed to, right? Um, uh, and so just kind of keeping that uh, open, I mean, you don't wanna be bugging these people every week. Hey, Kristen, how you doing? Yeah, great, it looks like Grable's doing great things. I mean, like, that's annoying. But, um, uh, but again, just being courteous, being a, um, you know, a good uh, granting organization. So we, when we did uh, um, Grable uh, the first time and we got rejected for it, you know, she said, yeah, we're just uh, um, concerned about long-term sustainability of the program. Um, and so then the next year, by then, we had gotten the NEH, and, they, and so they responded very differently. They were like, okay, now we see that you've gotten that, but we knew that was the thing that we needed. So I, I think it's just professional courtesy. Um, and, uh, you know, if a lot of cities have uh, um, uh, nonprofit uh, groups, sometimes they're kind of professionals groups and these kind of things. There's one of these in Pittsburgh um, where a lot of these people get together and network and do, you know, uh, kinds of professional development or just have dinner or something. And you can get involved with those if you're a part of a nonprofit. Um, and there you can develop relationships, right? Um, and it doesn't have to be anything skeezy. I mean, you're not like trying to like, you know, basically 
uh, be nice to somebody so they'll give you money. You're just getting to know them and they're getting to know your organization and that, um, that just helps everybody to understand and get on the same page. So, yeah. so one of the things I hear uh, most frequently when I submit paperwork through the research office at our institution or yeah. um, I'm talking with others who are writing grants is there, there's such small funds for a lot of work that mm -hmm. goes into them. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process and, and the thinking behind picking up small funds um, and trying to do it continuously uh, yeah. and writing those small fund grants. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think one of the benefits of that, because I, I, yeah, sometimes it can be a lot of work, but also it's kind of a, if you can prove your track record a little bit, you know, so okay, we had a $2,000 grant from, you know, the, uh, the city uh, um, cultural foundation or whatever, and we, we successfully completed this program, right? Now we're coming to this foundation. So sometimes you can think about them as just like proving that you can take a grant, manage it, you know, budget it, spend it basically on what you said you were gonna spend it on, right? Uh, um, and then, you know, successfully complete that, uh, that program, right? So, you can think about it in those terms, like this isn't just for the money, it's for proving that we are reliable and that people could give us more money. Um, I think that's one way to think about it. But yeah, you do, I mean, it can take a lot of time. And um, if you decide, you can outsource this. I mean, you can pay someone, they're grant writing consultants and things. You, you figure out what you're really getting for the money that you give them. Um, not that they're, you know, con artist or anything, I'm not at all, I mean, but I think what I mean is like, we figured out, we hired a consultant for a while, and then we were like, uh, we've done a couple of grants now, like we kind of know everything that this person's telling us. Like, I mean, it was sort of like, yeah, I mean, much more elaborate version of a lot of the stuff I've shared here, right? But write well, have a specific program in mind, have a budget that matches your narrative. You know, a lot of organizations don't have the time for that, so they hire a consultant. Um, or you know they're just not familiar enough with it. But if you have the time, or you have the ability, or you have the grad students uh, that you can <laughs> um, you can twist their arm and get them to help, um, so they get experience, right? Then uh, um, you don't necessarily have to hire a professional to do it. And and again, you can maybe start with a small grant and build from there. But yeah, sometimes it's like twenty something pages or all this paperwork, and the trouble of administering it, um, you know, and it just doesn't seem worth it. So you do have to figure that out too, right? Again, if it's a whole lot of work for 500 bucks, if you're part of a museum, can someone on your board find $500? You know, can their business give in-kind donations to cover a lot of that cost and you don't have to go through a grant, right? But, yeah. Speaking of in-kind donations, whenever you're applying for some of the larger grants and you've already gotten people on board and they're already supporting your mission, how much? How far does that go in proving that you're you're on a good path and and people are, are wanting to jump on to your success? How much of that should go into the proposal itself? Yeah, I think it's always good to have um, at least a couple of letters of support, right? Even if they're even if it's a program you're just doing within your institution and doesn't necessarily involve a partner, if someone else can give kind of outside testimony that your work has been really strong and, and that they, and maybe they, you want to have them on, uh, so I, I can think of one, so the, um, the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh um, just applied for an NEH grant to digitize a bunch of uh, archival materials related to Kennywood, which is one of the earliest uh, theme parks, one of the old trolley parks in Pittsburgh, right? Um, and so they said, would you kind of serve on this committee to evaluate the materials and say, recommend some things for digitization, and then would you write a letter to the DH saying why this matters and why it's important, right? So if you were able to get someone in the community just to say, you know, this museum does really good work and our community benefits because of these things, that all helps. It, it just, because they don't know you from, you know, anyone probably, right? I mean, they just didn't, you know. Um, and so that all kind of testifies to the, your uh, reputation in the community. Yeah, it's, it's even better if that person's going to have some role or has had some role in the actual workings of it. But yeah, I think it's, it's always good if they, if they let you put in a couple of letters of support. Yeah. So. 
Um, I have a question about your experience. Have you ever gotten a grant that just shocked you that you were funded? The NEH shock. I mean, like I was like speechless. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't believe that. Yeah, um, that that was yeah, just because I had no expectation that we were going to get it. I mean, that was the. I think that may be the only NEH grant anyone at Slippery Rock has ever gotten. Right. And I mean, I mean, it wasn't just me. There was my co-director also helped write the thing. So I'm not. But it, it uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I, I, I thought she was kidding. She was like, we got the NEH grant. So yeah, I mean, that happens, yeah. And do you have any advice for uh, organizing like all the grants that you're applying to or just keeping track of like all the materials you have to submit? Yeah, 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 that can be, um, that can be hard. I mean, and the good thing is also for grants, if you're applying for multiple grants for the same program, you can tweak some things and use the same narrative largely, right? You can use the same budget. You kind of, maybe you, you massage it a bit to fit um, the pri organization's priorities. But um, so one thing I forgot to mention is if you are in a university setting, um, there should be some grants and research kind of office. I don't know what they call it. it um, uh, I'm sure you have, a, have one of these. They can help you, especially with the research. Um, so there are subscription services that you can get on that will, you put in criteria, you know, um, and so, sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. Sometimes, you know, like, this doesn't fit at all what I'm looking for, but you can say I'm looking for history, I'm looking for preservation grants, I'm looking for archival collections or whatever. So that can help you in terms of organizing what, um, what fits your need. Um, I'm, I'll just say the wrong person to ask about organization, right? So uh, organizing anything, right? I did an archival internship in college and I was like, I do not want to be an archivist. I am not good at this, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, everybody's systems are kind of particular, I guess, and, and, and uh, unique to their own uh, style, but, yeah. Sorry, I'm not more help on that. <laughs> yeah. So I've been getting questions about writing budgets lately. Mm. Um, could you... I was wondering if you have your, your budget for the NEH grant and if you could walk us through it. And it sounds oh. like since it was matching, I'm wondering yeah, if you yeah. had to include the 200,000. Yeah, um, just one second. Let me see if I can dig around and find it. It, it. I have it on my laptop, but I don't have that connected. But I think I may have it on the Google Drive as well. Just one second. Just while Dr. Cowan's looking for that, as a brief plug for one of the resources he mentioned, the American uh, Association for State and Local History, if you do happen to be at all affiliated with the history department at UL, we have an institutional subscription as of this year, and if you're graduating from the public history program, you get one free year of membership. Oh, nice. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, talk to one of your professors and we can show you how to redeem that membership when you graduate. Yeah, okay, here we go. Yeah, that's a, um, it's, it's really good. And if you're part of a, a museum or a historical society that's not, uh, not a member, you, I would definitely encourage considering becoming a member. I don't, I don't know what the, I can't remember what the institutional fee for that is, but it's, it's very reasonable um, for what you get. Well, huh, why is it doing that? So since you're still looking, yeah, um, sorry, I'm gonna, I found it. I'm just trying to open it now. Yeah, yeah I'm going to take up the issue of like grant management of the documents. Um, there is nothing more simple than an Excel spreadsheet, right? Uh, there are lots of examples of types of spreadsheets that you can use, and in fact, you can search for grant management spreadsheets online, and you probably can find somebody's um, that is free and open access. Um, I know we personally have used Airtable as well, which is mm. also a free service, yeah. and Google Sheets, right, um, yeah. as options. And you just set it up to track, you know, what stage it's at and what documents are required, and it's 
it's good practice when you first go through a grant to make that list anyways, uh, and then you can start to check it off uh, and track what process you're at with management. Word documents work too, or whatever your notes document is, but I like the spreadsheet myself because I can sort it, right? Uh, and I can keep track that way, and you just make a new spreadsheet or you copy the spreadsheet with each grant that you do. Okay, I got it here. Great. Thanks for uh, bearing with me there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, um, this is um, so this is our, the budget that we uh, laid out um, that, and this grant was kind of quirky in that they want you to spend all the money in three years, um, so, it, which I would much rather kind of stretch it, but, uh, um, you know, that was, uh, was the way the grant was structured and we thought it, we, could, we could make it make sense, right? Um, so, uh, you know, just to go through some of the details of it um, the uh, uh, they want to know your budget first of all um, so they want to know like basically what uh, um, what do you spend money on um, already right um, and then uh, basically do you have potential sources for uh, which there's the uh, infamous Taco Bell Foundation right um, uh, for your matching uh, money right um, we didn't actually end up using any of these people or foundations, but you know, they want you to know, do you have an idea about where you're going with this, right? And nobody comes back to you and says, hey, you didn't get money from this place, you got money, they don't care where you get the money from ultimately, but you need to have a plan. Um, how that money's gonna be invested, so this was, and this is again, they had a very specific, it needs to be, you get the 100,000, then you have two years to raise the 100,000, and then it's put into an endowment um, that has to be spent down over three years, right? So who's managing that? Okay, well, for us, it's our university's foundation that manages, you know, gifts and, and donations and things, right? And, and, and grants from private um, agencies. Um, <laughs> I could get into a, a whole thing about, so anticipated rate of return on investment. So I called our, I called our foundation manager guy and I said, Man, what should I put down here, right? And I was like, I don't know. And, and I said, what about like 4%? And he's like, yeah, that's good. And then, and then we got the money and we all got in a room in with the president and the accounting people and all this. And, and he was like, 4%? Where are we gonna get 4% from? He's like, and I, and I said, I got it from you, right? You know, so, um, we worked all that out eventually, right? Uh, and, and, uh, but you know, these are details that uh, um, uh, it's always nice to be more certain about before, uh, um, before the time comes, right? And then so there we have um, the way the monies are to be spent by year. Um, and it's the budget justification is sort of like an expanded where you, you elaborate more on, you know, why are you spending X amount on transportation and visits to museums and theaters and all that sort of thing. Um, and how did you arrive at that number? And, uh, um, and so then you lay out uh, indirect costs also. If you're, uh, um, if you're associated with a university, um, this is something I didn't know about until I started writing grants that uh, um, this grant specified so that the university can take indirect costs for the administration required to administer a grant. Um, this one specified 10%. Um, I think the normal rate is something like 32% or something. Um, for uh, for our, do you have it higher? Wait, what is it? You know what? It's 42%. That's right. Yeah, because I was like, well, you know, that's interesting. Um, this one was nice in that it said that they couldn't take more than 10. Um, but uh, so you do want to factor that in if you're doing anything through the university, finding out what your indirect cost is and, and uh, how that works. Um, and then uh, were there other specific uh, questions that you had about the uh, terms of the budget? Am I, am I hitting the target that you wanted to? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I thought it was going to be a lot more detailed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this, I know. This is, um, yeah, this is actually very, um, Minimal, but I think this yeah. is the standard uh, sheet that they use for a lot of whoops. I'm not sure where it went now. I think it's behind this. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Yeah, and we do elaborate in the budget justification, like we say, like, okay, travel reimbursement we've calculated because the schools are X number of miles and this is how many trips the faculty make and, you know, so we're kind of laying some of that out, but it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's relatively, um, relatively minimal, really. So is that, is there any other questions or anything that, yeah? Uh, well, I mean, I guess if you had examples, so s smaller grants might have more detailed uh, requests for budgets. So I don't know if you, I, yeah. I think just to show a comparison. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if I have access to any of the other grants uh, budget. No, um, that's okay. You know, no, it's okay. I mean, because I, I, I think it is helpful um, in a lot of ways. Uh, let's see, let's go back. I think that there, uh, we can get to the Grable um, they had a, um, so they have a specific form that you fill out that has, and, and this is the other thing is that some organizations have their own form, some want, you know, just, you just kind of put it in a spreadsheet. Some have things that you're supposed to, uh, um, uh, the ways that they want uh, budgets structured, right? And so you have to, again, pay attention to those details. Um, uh, Oh, I'd have to log in. I don't have any of that info. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but so is that so you didn't actually have to calculate specifics for how much you're going to spend on transportation and trips. You were able to kind of lump everything together and say fifty thousand dollars is going to go to this whole list of things. Yeah. Again, in the justification, we would break down like there's 12 faculty and you know distance from campus to high school. So that's mileage reimbursement and you know. So we had somebody call the charter bus company and how much do you charge for a bus? You know, okay, so we put that in. So we sort of had a running specific budget, but then they want it listed pretty minimally there. Again, I think it's also because, you know, the reviewers are there. I mean, I think you're paid 250 bucks or something, right? And you're reviewing like 15 of these, right? So again, that also makes the argument for really clear writing. Because what if yours is like 12th? Like you're getting, the reviewers are getting pretty bleary eyed. Um, and so I think they want budgets that are accessible to the, to the uh, reviewers too. Um, and uh, yeah, so the justification breaks it out a little bit more. But, but yeah, some of them are incredibly specific. Like they want invoices, like what the projected cost would be and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. It's easier, the more specific you are actually, the better the more you know up front, because then you don't have to go back and say, oh, by the way, we actually are gonna be, this is gonna be $1,000 over, and that kind of thing. That gets complicated. Yeah, uh, any other questions or anything else I can? I'd be glad to talk more afterwards or whatever, but th thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> So just because this always comes up, what would you say your average rate of grant acceptance is. Oh. Have you ever calculated it? No. Um, so maybe give us hope that, you know, like we apply to lots of them, but. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, uh, I guess it's like baseball, right? Like hitting 300 will get you in the Hall of Fame. So, um, you know, getting a one out of three is, is pretty good rate, uh, I would say. Um, so it, I think that's roughly about where we are. Um, Again, uh, um, we got rejected by Taco Bell. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, it, it's, you, you just kind of keep that persistence up and, and know that that's gonna happen and accept it as part of it. Yeah, but. Mm -hmm. the Council for Public History. Yeah. Uh, and they told us for their public engagement grants, yeah. they have a 15% oh, acceptance yeah. rate and that's after they winnow out people through the early stages yeah and those weren't even the big grants <laughs> right yeah yeah well in that um i think neh does at the bottom of each grant they put some really discouraging statistic right you know, this is a 27 percent funding rate or something you're like oh but you know um that uh um, and, and again that, that the importance of drafts right hey would someone look at this so neh will tell you if you want a draft proposal send it by this date and then we'll give you feedback. And we did that several times, but um, yeah. And I mean, there's also a lot of you, of course, that are very successful in getting grants and have 
lots to uh, say about that too. So. If you are not in the university, I will say also take advantage to the extent that they're able, given time constraints and other things going on, of the university as a resource. I mean, especially a, a department that has public history as one of its points of emphasis. Um, I wish that more institutions would draw on what we have to offer, right, in, in the ways that we can. Um, again, you know, professors get really busy, especially this time of year, but the, I think most, in most cases we want to, to help and to partner and, and do what we can, so um, yeah. I'm volunteering all the faculty here to, to be <laughs> very helpful of me, I know. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, well thanks guys, I enjoyed this, it's a lot of fun. Yeah.